Hi and welcome back to the channel. Ah, uh, yep, it's number four of the January where I am only watching films I have not watched before. And I've got three movies, two of which are classics, one of which is a bit of a hidden gem that I'm going to have a chat about. And these ones I liked a lot. It was incredibly rewarding to watch them. And it's, um, and if there's anything in common between them, it's that they were all made in Europe. They're not all European films. Two of them are but the third one isn't. Let's get started with a movie which is kind of a Euro spy movie and imprint films who are an Australian company that's been doing some really great stuff with Blu-rays recently have just released it and I wanted to see it. I like the star, I like the idea, I like the story and it is from 1968. House of Cards starring George Papad, Inga Stevens and Orson Welles. Now this one is nothing to do with the House of Cards starring the benighted Kevin Spacey. It's directed by John Gilman and it's uh, probably for me one of his best movies. It's a tongue-in-cheek kind of adventure film starring George Papad as a writer come boxer, a little bit of an Ernest Hemingway kind of character who gets involved with a neo-fascist movement in France and Italy in the 1960s. Now, the, the um, disc has slipcovers. I love slipcovers on discs. There's the um, slipcover. There's the back of the slipcover. There is the inner cover, which has got some different um, artwork on it. And the back is kind of like that. Well, it's exactly like that, really. Totally by accident, George Pepard encounters a young boy who for some reason has a pistol and who shoots at the car he's driving. So Pepard's character, his name's Reno, takes the kid back to his family and finds out that he's part of a very wealthy aristocratic French family who have had some adversity since the problems in Algeria in the early 1960s. I'll leave you to look up that yourself. The boy's mother, however, is American and she's played by Inga Stevens. Her name's Anne. And Inga Stevens was a really interesting actress. Unfortunately, she um, died early, but in this one, she's really good. And she kind of essays vulnerability and a kind of inner strength at the same time. So Reno is hired as a kind of nanny for this young boy to give him a, a positive male role model because the males in his family and, and the family circle of friends are probably not the kind of people you want influencing a child. And so he gets involved with it. He's attracted to Anne and Anne's attracted to him. And the aristocratic family hold a very big party where it becomes fairly clear fairly quickly that they're involved in a neo-fascist movement in Europe, which is quite extensive. So Orson Welles plays the leader of the fascist movement, a guy called Leshino, who is bombastic and over the top and Wells gets three good scenes in this movie. He's only really in three scenes. Um, all of which were filmed in Italy. The interiors for the movie were shot at Cinecittà Studios in Italy. The exteriors were filmed in Paris and in Rome. I saw you fight in the Val Diva about a year ago, the night you knocked out that big Senegalese. I guess lucky. Right, if you hadn't run him to death he would have cut you to pieces. I'm less, you know. I was a boxer myself, also a one-time priest, an unfrocked communist. Uh, bad poet, a good lover, and a big eater. What are you? I'm a vaccinated white Protestant American male with a slight sinus condition. And the movie is kind of a bit of a fun 60s adventure film. It's a, it's a kind of the equivalent of those men's magazines from the 1960s which were full of short stories about men doing adventures. It's in very much in that kind of a mode. And the movie has its tongue firmly in its cheek because the opening scene is a point of view shot in the Seine in Paris from the point of view of a corpse floating down the river. It sets you up with the idea of this isn't a very serious film. It's meant to be an entertainment. It's nothing more than that. There's a good rapport between George Pepard and Inga Stevens as well. And the rest of the cast is filled out with some interesting English and European character actors just giving us the um, world 
of this crazy little fascist movement. There's actually an American as well. The American side of it is an American millionaire who is kind of anti-sex. Sex and smut. Smut and sex. In the magazines, in the movies. Don't you get you all worked up everywhere you look. My own family doctors told me that sex is exhaustive and destructive. It can damage your nervous system and shorten life. I tell you, we're going to stop it. The movie is very polished. It looks good. There's some good action scenes uh, of Papard's character Reno climbing across rooftops in Italian villas and things like that. And there's a fantastic soundtrack, which I think is incredibly underrated by Francis Lai, which has a little bit of the same kind of melancholy spy feel that you got in some of the 1960s John Barry soundtracks, but it's very much a thing of its own. And then you get a climax at the end where Reno is fighting the bad guys. Um, there's one of them who has a sword cane, and I'm, I'm a big fan of sword canes in fight scenes and movies. And it all takes place in the Colosseum in Rome. Now, this isn't Way of the Dragon where Bruce Lee fights Chuck Norris and kills him in the Colosseum, but it's actually filmed in Asia. This was actually filmed on location in the Colosseum. And also you get a climax with Orson Welles because the fascists have kidnapped the young boy and so uh, Reno and Anne have to go and get him. There's a little bit of a feel in the chase sequences there of the 39 steps, which doesn't do the movie any disservice. It's a lot of fun with uh, Reno and Anne trying to run away from the authorities who are looking for him for a murder that he didn't commit. And it, it just kind of works. It, it's very much a, a kind of 60s programmer, but it's at the top level of it for me. And the addition of Orson Welles, plus John Gilliman's fantastic direction and Francis Lye's soundtrack makes House of Cards a recommend from me. If you haven't seen it, you should. And uh, in print, do such a nice package of it that you'll want to have this. Now there is a, an audio commentary by film historian Scott Harrison. I'm not a fan of it, I'll be honest with you. Uh, he doesn't stay on track, he kind of waffles away. The things he's saying aren't in tune with what's appearing on the screen, so there's no linkage between what you're watching and what he's saying. I'm not sure whether he's having an off day, but it just doesn't work for me as a commentary, so that's the one weak spot in this. But apart from that, I recommend House of Cards. It's a kind of movie I used to watch in Saturday matinees in the 60s. Imprint is doing such good work with these ones. Now, I've got a few of them, some of which I've already seen, so I can't do them here in January. But I will be doing a review of some of them in February because there are some good movies there. There are some favourites of mine, and I'm going to take a look at the imprint versions of them for you in February. So that's the first of the three, and the least in some ways. The second one takes us back to 1926 and Ufa Studios in Germany. I've been looking forward to watching this one. It's the last movie that F.W. Murnau did in Germany before he went to Hollywood and ended up um, in a car accident where his 14-year-old Filipino houseboy crashed a car into a tree and killed Murnau. Now, there's a little more to that story, but I'll leave you to find out what that is. This one is Faust. Now, Murnau's Faust blew me away. It really is a fantastic piece of cinema. It's very impressionistic. It has a kind of medieval feel about it, which is kind of right because it is based on a medieval German legend. And it owes a little bit, of course, to Christopher Marlowe's version of Faust and Goethe's Faust as well, but it is a thing of its own. Now, this was Murnau's last film with Ufa and it didn't make money but they gave him an almost unlimited budget because his last movie, The Last Shout I think it's called, was an incredible success. Now the story we all know, Faust is a medieval alchemist, he's trying to turn base metals into gold and he becomes the subject of a bet between an archangel and Mephisto played by Emil Jannings about whether human beings are corruptible the bet, which the angel never quite agrees to, leads Mephisto to come to Earth and start messing around with Faust's life. First, he puts a plague through the town, which kills half of the people in the town in a few weeks, while, while Faust looks for a cure and is unsuccessful in finding one. Mephisto then makes himself known to Faust and 
offers him anything he wants for a day. And so Faust um, gets a bunch of things. He gets youth. He's an old man, so he becomes young again. And he also gets to fall in love with and have fall in love with him, the most beautiful woman in Italy. And right as they're about to consummate the relationship, Mephisto turns up and says, your 24 hours is up. Sell your soul to me if you want the rest of it, which is kind of the way, I suppose, drug dealers work. Faust is played by Gerst Eggman, who was a Swedish actor, and he does a really good job of it. He's just at that age where in good makeup, he can play old very well. And he's still young enough, he's in his 30s at the time, he's still young enough to play the young Faust. But the thing that gets me in this movie, and the thing that gets everybody who watches this movie is, the wonderful evocation of the period and evocation of the mythology of Faust. The confrontation at the start between the Archangel and Mephisto is fantastic. Mephisto looming over the town and spreading the plague across the town is beautifully done. He then carries Faust across a mountain range to Italy and we see them traveling across the landscape and it's all done with models but they're on an incredibly long the model must have been what was it 20 odd meters long and so the camera and you've got to remember this is 1920s cameras flowed across the landscape in a really interesting way you know it's a model but you kind of buy into it because the scenes before have sucked you into the world that Murnau created with this movie. After agreeing to Mephisto's um, terms, Faust goes back to his hometown and falls in love with a young woman called Gretchen, played by Camilla Horn. And there's some really nice scenes between the auntie of Gretchen and Emil Yanning's Mephisto, where he tempts and seduces the aunt. And they are kind of lighter and lift the tone a little bit. It's slightly raunchy, slightly bawdy but it really works in the context of the film. This movie has a look to it, which is incredible. And it was a hard movie to make too. It took them six months to make the film. And they had two cameras alongside each other and many multiple takes because to get enough prints to be able to show this one widely, they had to do multiple takes and use different takes for different prints. So the American print looks slightly different than the German print which looks slightly different than the French print. And the um, Blu-ray I've got gives you the best of them all. It was a really hard thing. The reason they had to use multiple takes is that the original negatives weren't strong enough to make the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prints out of them. So they had to have multiple takes and multiple kind of setups and multiple negatives to be able to do this. It was really hard for the actors as well because the temperature went up to 50 degrees centigrade in the studios with all the hot lights. And there are scenes where Gretchen is struggling through a snowstorm and they did all that with salt. So you've got all this salt blowing onto this poor woman and uh, basically drying out her skin and uh, irritating her eyes and all that kind of thing because it's the only thing they had that could realistically emulate snow. It's an incredible film, the look of it and the way that Murnau kind of paints with light is incredible. He uses light and smoke and shadow and the sets and the props and, and the miniatures to give us an incredible world. It really does look fantastic and shows for one of the first times the possibility of film. You've got to remember this was made in the same year as Metropolis and where Metropolis was blatantly science fiction, this one's blatantly fantasy. But Ufa was doing some incredible work in 1925, 1926 and Faust is a definite recommend from me. It's a classic of cinema. It's on almost everybody's list of 100 movies to watch before you die. And it really shows how on limited technological platforms you can tell a story and create a world by using the imagination and the creativity of your cast and crew and give something that hadn't been seen on film before. There have been other versions of Faust earlier than this but this one is the definitive version. There was also Dr. Faustus, which was made in the 1960s with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. And of course, there are movies like Bedazzled, which is another version of the Faust legend. And I don't recommend you look at the version with Brendan Fraser and Elizabeth Hurley in it because it's crap. But this one is the real deal. 
The third movie is one that I had in a box set of classic cinema and I didn't watch for a decade. It's one of Jean Cocteau's best films. It's as good as his Beauty and the Beast. Starring the same guy, Jean Marais. Orpheus. From 1950, stars Jean Marais as Orpheus, who's a famous poet in modern day France. Now, the, the legend of Orpheus and Eurydice is brought up to modern times. His wife, Eurydice, is played by Marie Day. And Orpheus is a poet who's just kind of peaking. He's slightly past his prime as a poet. He's very, very popular. He's well known. And being an incredibly handsome guy, he uh, is kind of a little bit of a star. But he's a little bit past his peak. And there are a whole bunch of younger poets who are envious of him and who also adore him at the same time. We see an encounter between Orpheus and the poets, and there are a lot of them, at a poet's cafe in uh, Paris, where there's an altercation. One of the young poets is hit by a motorcycle and is taken away by a woman in a limousine uh, who also gets Orpheus as a witness to come with her. So she drives into the countryside, and then suddenly outside the car, everything becomes a negative. And she takes both the dead man and Orpheus to a house where she meets the two motorcycle riders who hit the guy and the guy comes back to life. What Orpheus doesn't know and later finds out is that this woman called the princess is an embodiment of death. And so Orpheus is taken back to his home by the chauffeur of the princess. The chauffeur of the Princess Hurtebis, played by uh, Francois Perrier, takes Orpheus back to his home and meets Eurydice, Orpheus' wife, who's a little bit neglected, really. Orpheus is obsessed with the events that have just occurred and with some weird radio signals that are coming through a car, the car radio of the limousine. Orpheus is obsessed with the Princess and increasingly Hurtebis is falling in love with Eurydice. Then Eurydice dies and the princess takes her soul to an afterlife. Now this isn't a Christian kind of thing. It's a parable in a sense, so there's no real Christian iconography in this one. Orpheus convinces her to be to take him to the afterlife so that he can bring Eurydice back, but he's also in love with the princess. So he's conflicted about being in love with either his wife Eurydice, who is pregnant with a child, or the evocation of death. The princess is played by Maria Casares, and she's a, a striking figure. And at the start of the film, she's very kind of haughty and dismissive and, and kind of authoritarian. But she softens because she falls in love with Orpheus as well. This movie is kind of surrealistic and impressionistic. It's not to be taken in a literal sense. It's all about symbolism and, and evocations of mood. And it's a haunting film. And the special effects are done incredibly well. There are some bits where the special effects are done by reversing the, the camera shots. One of the ways to the afterlife, apart from going in the chauffeur um, limousine, is to go through mirrors, because mirrors are where we see our death. When you look in a mirror, you see yourself aging, you see, yourself heading towards death, so mirrors are a portal to the afterlife and to death. And the movie is very strong in that symbolism. And we get some interesting scenes of Orpheus piercing the mirror, one of which was done with a vat of mercury as the mirror, and it works really well. There are some really weird and evocative scenes in this film. And the afterlife, a lot of it was filmed on a bombed out military academy called saint Cyr near Paris, which uh, gives us a kind of shattered and ruined afterlife where bureaucrats run death and the princess and her to bees are called to task for what the way they've handled the situation of Orpheus and Eurydice. This movie, it's hard to describe, it's, it's a movie to be experienced. Um, you can't get too analytical about it because if you do, the illusion shatters. But it's an incredibly evocative film. And Jean Marais, who was an incredibly good-looking guy, 
He later went on to do some really interesting action films in the 50s and 60s, but at this stage, incredibly good looking guy. And before this movie was made, up until two years before the movie was made, Jean Marais was a lover of Jean Cocteau, the writer and director of the film, so there was obviously a, quite a strong relationship between actor and director-writer. And that shows in the film as well. He shoots Marais incredibly well. The movie has an, a really satisfying ending too. There's sacrifices made for people who are loved. And it just, it ends perfectly. And the evocation of the afterlife, some of which I'm not going to tell you about because you've got to experience that yourself. It's, it's done really, really interestingly and with a vivid and kind of grounded imagination. I um, don't know whether it's the best movie I've seen this year so far, but I know it's incredibly memorable. And, and in the best possible way, it's stayed with me since I've watched it. And after January is over, I'm going to watch it again. I think it's an incredibly beautiful film. It takes us to another world by using trickery. Yeah, there's camera trickery and there's kind of camera angle trickery and there, there are little bits and pieces done with sets. But Cocteau lures you into the world in a wonderful way. And there's a kind of momentum to it. You want to find out what's going to happen. You want to, go to, find, you want to find out what's happening with this weird love triangle between her to beast, Orpheus, Eurydice and the princess. There's no other movie quite like it. And it's incredibly influential as well. It's obviously been an influence on things like Twin Peaks, David Lynch's Twin Peaks. It's definitely an influence on, on television series like Sapphire and Steel, and some kind of stories in Doctor Who as well. Um, it's an influence on a couple of episodes of Twilight Zone. The movie is something you need to check out. There is a Criterion edition of it if you can find it, and I recommend that you do. And for me, watching it was an incredibly satisfying experience. So anyway, that's it for this time around. Thank you very, very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, and subscribing, and leaving a comment. And you can also support the channel by going to patreon.com slash paleocinema and donating. I'm going to continue this. I think we're almost halfway through January and I'm still feeling the struggle of only watching movies I haven't watched before. But with these three films, House of Cards, Orpheus and Faust, I think I'm going to be okay. I think I'm going to get through it without failing because I'm going to select the movies I watch very carefully so that all of them are worth my time and worth me really kind of leaning into the films and just kind of reattaching myself to the reasons I love cinema. So anyway, look after yourselves, take care, be safe, watch some good movies, this time don't watch some bad movies. And I'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.